So, uh, everyone, welcome to the oddball lunch session. Thank you. Uh, yes, so I'm going to talk about uh, not how to do a PhD, and I hope to get uh, many questions on Slack or cardboard uh, during the talk directly. Uh, please ask questions. If you don't ask any, in, enough questions, I will go for longer, and then the queue at lunchtime will be very uh, large. <laughs> so you have to ask questions. So uh, first, I thought I could introduce myself. Uh, so I'm Gabriel, and I did uh, two years of uh, master, uh, uh, research master in physics in Paris, and then I did a PhD in Gallium, which is an INRIA team. INRIA is a French national research institute, so it's a big place where people are paid to do research all day. Uh, and in my PhD, I started working on ML model systems, and after a year, uh, I realized, and my advisor realized that uh, we were not making much progress. So I kind of switched gears and started working on uh, something completely different. Uh, then at some point I defended, uh, well at least I finished my PhD, uh, finally, uh, in 2015, and I started a, a postdoc in, uh, at, so on the left, this is uh, Didier, so he's very old, so it's a black and white picture. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then I started a postdoc at Northeastern with Amal, that you have seen, uh, in person, uh, and we worked on two things, one uh, related to uh, what you talked about, and uh, one other uh, also with Jan Vitek, who is the third person on the staff. Okay, and uh, at the end of uh, July, I went back to France, and uh, uh, yesterday, I started a position uh, at uh, Inria Saclay, which is another Inria center, in Parsifal, uh, another research team, uh, where I'm actually a, a permanent researcher. Okay, so that's why uh, there is no end date. Uh, okay, uh, so why the title of the talk? Well, at Northeastern there, were, there is also a scary uh, person called Matthias Felizen, who is actually very nice when you talk to him in person, so do that. Uh, that says, approximately, uh, junior researchers' uh, talks at Pilon de Voodoo are terrible, uh, because they don't have the perspective to tell students how to do a PhD. Mm -hmm. So uh, the talk is not uh, how to do a PhD. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one reason is that you can find better advice somewhere else. Uh, Chris also pointed out this morning that most advice tends to be bad. Unfortunately, there will be advice in the talk, but it will be kind of remarks and side comments and things that may maybe not be in your typical uh, how to do a PhD. Uh, advice <coughs> and again, please ask questions. Otherwise, uh, no queue at lunch time. Matthias also said, "Oh, uh, besides, they should be ashamed of themselves because they don't even stay around students uh, after the sessions." Uh, so I tried at least not to fail by this metric. Uh, and so please uh, come around during the long queue at lunch time, uh, asking me questions. Okay. So uh, my first point on uh, PhD is that uh, the experience depends a lot on where you are. Uh, and I, I contracted North American Europe because I, I've seen a bit of both. And I can tell you that they are completely different. Okay? A lot of the things that, uh, I mean, some of the things that Chris was talking about don't make that much sense in the French context. And in fact, in Europe, well, French PhD is completely different from uh, UK PhD, which is completely different from the German PhD. Uh, and then uh, there are, of course, many other places where research is done, South America, Asia, Africa. I don't have any experience of the PhD there, and I, I think it's, again, quite different. So a lot of the advice you hear uh, often is given with a US perspective, but in any case, uh, you have to remember that uh, uh, the, the experience are very different, and uh, ICFP is an opportunity to meet people that, that actually do uh, things in a fairly different way from what you do. Uh, Slide on advisors. Uh, advisors are all different. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some of them are not that good at advising. Uh, so, uh, one thing that can happen is that uh, a student and an advisor are not a good match for each other. That happens. It's life. It's unfortunate. But there are also some students that are not good match for any advisor, and some advisors that are not good matches for almost any student. One way to detect that is easy. Uh, ask a previous student. Uh, um, advisors are so incomplete 
in the sense that if you think of what an advisor says as a kind of uh, proof system, uh, if it does not say x, that does not mean that it says not x. <laughs> so uh, sometimes it's fine to, to do things that were not explicitly, uh, you were not explicitly told to, to take initiatives. <laughs> Uh, uh, when I discussed this slide, uh, William started asking whether when I say X, you should actually do X. Uh, that is outside the scope of this. <laughs> uh, so this is the, the bad wood slide, and I had it early enough in the talk so that uh, you don't uh, feel down by the end of the talk. Uh, during a PhD, for most people, a large majority of people, have at least one time that is completely crappy. And some people with fortunity have several times like that. So uh, for me, uh, a part of my manuscript writing was very bad, and I thought several times of quitting and getting a job programming in a nice programming language uh, to not have to complete the damn thing. Uh, some people uh, are more or less fortunate in the sense that the crappy times come earlier in the PhD. Uh, and that is something that is unfortunately normal. So if that happens to you, if that happens, when that happens to you, uh, you should not feel like you are bad at what you do because of that, because unfortunately it's not. There are some reasons why. The first uh, is uh, Ben Greenman, who is a PhD in our system, formulated that research is when it can fail. So uh, the point of what we are doing is to do hard stuff, and sometimes you will try to prove something uh, for months, and you will never succeed. Uh, maybe you give up, maybe in the end you succeed, but then you will feel very bad. And also, it is as part of the, of the job that you do stuff that doesn't work. Another is that the review system uh, introduces some randomness in the process uh, that has the effect that even good work can be rejected several times in a row. And in fact, uh, many established researchers have uh, stories about how one of the papers that is best known uh, actually was rejected uh, five times before being accepted. And uh, the scale. Uh, the time scale means that you could spend a year and a half, uh, two years pushing for a particular bit of work that everyone hates, and then you will feel very bad. Uh, that is unfortunate, it happened to many people, and you have to know that uh, that's part of the job. One reason why you may not have heard that much of Gilata before is that that's a remark that a student at PMW at Popol made. Uh, I don't think uh, she's in the room, but otherwise, thank you. Uh, we speak publicly about our successes. Uh, so when people have pap papers accepted, they win in the world, whatever. They tweet about it, they write about it. But when you fail, when you get a paper rejected, you don't say anything. And so if you look at the people around you, it feels like uh, you are surrounded by successful people and you yourself are failures. That's not at all how it is. In fact, most people have hard times during the PG and also later, of course, but the talk is focused on the PhD. So if you feel bad, uh, well, one thing you can do at least, there are many things you can do, is to talk about it to your colleagues, for example. And you should know that uh, it's not about you, and it does not mean that uh, you, you are doing bad work or you are a bad person. Uh, so listening and talking, very important. So doing your work in general, talk to the people in your lab, OK? If there is a PhD student across from your office, and you have no idea what their PhD topic is or what they are currently doing as part of their PhD topic, that's not right. You, you, should, you should know. So talk to them. And one reason is that often when people uh, is, uh, have a hard time, a natural reflex is to isolate themselves. Okay? So that could happen to you. That could be happening to uh, someone else in the same building. And regularly talking to other people is a good way to, to fight that off and that improves the PhD experience for everyone. So, uh, a small anecdote, uh, a very good friend of mine uh, started uh, their PhD thinking, oh, uh, um, I just go to the library and work by myself. Uh, and after a year, we realized that it's not so nice and it's actually sensibly better to make an effort to go to the office and meet your colleagues, talk about them, and uh, to, to them. Uh, you should feel free to ask uh, questions uh, during conferences, but also in general to people that are in your lab and also people outside. So last year, at some point, uh, I had a difficult decision to make uh, uh, um, related to a paper, and I didn't really know what to do. And I wrote an email to someone that uh, had never met me in person. Okay? And I asked them, and they replied. So researchers tend to be generous with their time. If you have a genuine question to ask them, 
so you can use that, that opportunity uh, in, in your office, even outside. Uh, when I ask what advice should be given to beginning PhD students, uh, Ron Garcia told me, talk to your yourself. And then he said, oh, I need to go prepare my talk with night. So I don't actually know what he meant. But uh, my interpretation of it would be that uh, it, in science, we value scientific honesty in the stuff we write and the way we present it. But also in research, I think it's very useful to be sincere. There is no, uh, uh, there is, from my perspective, which of course is maybe a bit privileged, there, there, there are no reasons to, to be dishonest about uh, what you feel or how you, the, your work is going. Uh, and in general, uh, uh, the fact that, mo I mean, that people are sincere and will t say what they think, I mean, of course in a polite, careful way, uh, uh, is part of the work and that makes it nice. Uh, so I think that's a good advice. Uh, of course, that may be harder when you are, you are uh, talking with someone that, and there is a power dynamic, you are their supervisor or co-oversy. But academia does not have too much of a strong hierarchy, uh, which is nice from this perspective. Uh, uh, listening and talking, there is also the part about talking about science. So you should do that. It is good. Uh, attending talks, for example, is important. Of course, if you spend, if you listen for uh, 10 one-hour talks a week, that is going to consume a large amount of your time. Maybe that is too much. But often people kind of uh, uh, don't do enough, I think, in, in this respect. If you do a whole PhD without listening for scientific talks, that's not so good. Uh, so that hearing talks that you learn about other people's work, you should always try also try to give talks if you can, it is good, and go to summer schools. For example, the OPSS summer school that was mentioned is a place, if you like ICFP, uh, you would like OPSS, so you should think about it. And personally, uh, I like local events. So for example, in France, there is GIFLA, which is a, a kind of French ICFP, it's two days, it's smaller, but there is a nice work being presented that sometimes end up in, I mean, most of them end up in uh, bigger conferences than there was. And be because it's small, you can talk to everyone and get to know them. So ICFP is 600 people. By the end of the week, maybe you would have met 80, 90, 100 people. Uh, at a small event, uh, you, can, you can end up knowing everyone. That is way less exhausting and, and also very nice. So I think I'm find that. Uh, I go there, and when I can, I send a talk to Apply as a student volunteer, see the shirt, student volunteer. It's very nice to get a lot of experience uh, helping the organization of conference. And consider uh, having a lab blog where you write some blog articles about what you are doing. It has many nice benefits, but then not everybody likes that, and it's fine. Uh, ooh, I'm doing good on time. Uh, I'm doing good on time because uh, no one asked a question yet. So uh, I ask for a question. Uh, come on. <laughs> yes? Um, earlier on, you talked about how you had experience in uh, Europe and North America. So I presume you uh, studied in France and then decided to do a PhD in North America. Um, I was wondering how you sort of came to that decision and um, what advice you would give to someone who was also thinking about those two areas. So uh, actually, I did my PhD in France, and I did my postdoc in the US. Uh, so I don't have a first -hand personal experience of PhD thesis in the US. Uh, 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 but I did talk to plenty of PhD students when I was there. Uh, the two systems are quite different. I had some things about like rough comparison, but then I, I figured out that they were mostly false, and I removed them from the slide. Uh, um, I think for me, the French PhD process worked very well. Uh, so uh, one difference, I mean, one of the most obvious differences in France, you separate the master from the PhD, whereas in the US you have a graduate school period. Uh, and the, during the first two years, you do a lot of master courses, but you also start doing research. And maybe you did less courses than what I did uh, as a master student. Uh, no, I don't want to get into a comparison and advice on that. I think uh, uh, the talk is not uh, the right venue. Um, um, one thing that is unfortunate about the European system is that it's a bit harder to find funding for the whole thing. So if you need funding for your studies, 
uh, the getting in a graduate school in the US does both, whereas few of the research masters in, in Europe have good funding programs. So that's something that can be that can be different. But some of them do, and so if you are interested in master in Europe, you should you should uh, consider that option. This is a good topic for the panel. Yes. I'm actually German. I did my undergraduate degree in Germany. I also studied in the UK and then I ended up doing my PhD at Carnegie Mellon and I then accepted a faculty position in Canada. <laughs> so um, I have no experience with Asia, but a lot of experience with North America and Europe. But um, I think also Chris advised in the morning of picking the people and the topic you want to work on first and then the place at least makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, so I would say that maybe the difference between the US and Europe is kind of auxiliary part of uh, who is the group, who is the person you want to work in, uh, with, or uh, uh, That would be my sense, but of course, uh, opinions differ. So uh, publish your work. So do have a web page. If you don't have a web page, this is the single most important comment you will hear during PLNW. Uh, sorry, other speakers. Uh, <laughs> make yourself a web page tomorrow with your name, your picture, and one paragraph of what you are doing during your PhD. Okay? Because uh, when people want to find you, the first thing is they will Google whatever they remember your name, and you want them to be able to find you. And eventually, you will be able to put links to papers and so on. But having a web page is the first step, very important. Uh, please indicate a personal preference. Uh, when you have a paper that is uh, published, accepted, and so on, you should consider putting the long version of it, the nice, the nice version with the foot and the detail, on archive. Uh, one reason is that it's free, it works well, and it's long-term archiving, better than the web page that is going to be dead in, in three, five years. You don't need to wait for your advisor to ask for it, because they never will. <laughs> uh, so don't wait. And also, uh, you may subscribe to archive to get emails daily about, oh, these are the papers that have been uh, uh, uploaded uh, in the last few days. And that is a very interesting way to keep in touch with the research of other people in your area. So go to this web page, look at the kind of old looking interface, and consider submitting your papers there. Uh, so this is please. So it's a kind of, you could consider doing that. The next paragraph is more, uh, the next two paragraphs are a bit more forceful. If you have a paper that is accepted, you have to get the draft online as soon as possible. On your web page, uh, wherever, on GitHub. Uh, so if I Google the title of your paper, I want to find the PDF. Because I found the paper uh, in the list of accepted papers. You can always, you know, if you, oh, but I'm going to make changes, you can update the, the, the URL with the new version. That's not an argument. And you should not wait for the conference to release it, because they will release it at best the week before the conference. And uh, I will spend uh, three or four more months before the conference looking at the work and thinking about whether I find it interesting. And many other people will. So the sooner you get your paper uh, published, the better. Uh, and people actually do read papers uh, that are going to be presented at the conference. So you, you should absolutely do that. In particular, I mean, the reason why most of us and you are funding through some kind of taxpayers' money is that the point of research is not only to think about our problem, but to give uh, the result of your thinking to everyone freely. So if you have a paper accepted somewhere and I cannot find it, I cannot read the paper, you are not doing your job properly. Okay? So if you don't want to sack, put your PDF online somewhere. Uh, uh, I think that would be a very uh, clear part of uh, what research is about. But unfortunately, uh, even for ACP papers, many of them were, mm, maybe five of them, uh, uh, over 40 or so papers, were not available more than one week before the conference. And that's very bad. Shame on them. <laughs> OK, uh, last comment. I think that one really matters. So please start, if you were not before, or keep writing programs sometimes on the side or as part of your research. One reason is that we are researching programming languages. So uh, uh, if you give courses on something that you actually never practice yourself, uh, that's going to, there is going to be an unfortunate disconnect at some point. Uh, another, uh, yeah, if we
we are talking about farming languages, we should have some practical experience of it. And number is that it can be a fun distraction because uh, this may sound like a value judgment. I, I don't think it is. But programming is way easier than some things you do when you do research. And so sometimes your brain will feel like it's about to fry or a stack overflow or whatever. And instead, going to hack some code can be a, a, a distraction or even kind of soothing. Okay? Uh, if you do meditation, I guess that's also good. But uh, consider uh, programming. Uh, some people uh, come into computer science PhD from a different background where uh, they did not do a lot of programming during their, their earlier studies. And they think, uh, oh, all these people around me are genius hackers. I don't know how to program. Uh, uh, I'm an imposter. I should not be here. I cannot even touch a computer. Uh, in fact, many people learn how to program in their 40s, in, in their 30s. So starting as you start a PhD in computer science is not worse than any other starting point. You can do some programming. Uh, and there is, there is no shame about being a beginner uh, in any area, including programming in uh, whatever programming language you, you learn. So I'm done with the talk. And I think I'm about on time. So uh, I expect to get more questions. Uh, yes, yes, yes. We have some minutes for questions. Uh, go for it. Yeah, just that last slide about programming. Uh, mm -hmm. When you're writing code for some research, how do you um, balance the contention between I need to write this code to do my research and I want to make a nice library that other people can actually use? Uh, I'm sort of a perfectionist, so I do nice code for my research whenever I can. Uh, I think I don't have time. is usually not a very good excuse to write crappy code. Uh, but then your mileage can be very But the, again, there are different sort of metrics of what is considered good code. Because there's the nice abstract theoretical good code, and then there's um, what is the performance and what people actually want to use, and what, what fits well in the ecosystem, and what happens to people already using. Right, so I think one measure. Yes. So if you, do, if you write a given program to demonstrate a point in your research, uh, you have to make sure that it demonstrates the point. But for example, it may, in some other respect, may be hopelessly slow. And maybe you could spend two extra weeks implementing a very clever algorithm uh, to make it fast. Uh, and in that case, I would say, well, the code demonstrates the point. Uh, put it on GitHub. It can be uh, nice and not looking like a horrible mess, but slow. That is fine. In my experience, this exact question never happened, uh, in the sense that it's more like uh, I hacked terribly, and my comic messages, messages are all daft, and, and the code looks like crap, and what should I do? Versus I follow some reasonable coding principles, or I clean up the mess after I did it. Uh, but the, the, the scenario you present, uh, I would say it's reasonable to have something that is usable, somewhat maintainable, even if it's not up to the standards of some other open source library in some respects or whatever. Yeah? What was the first time you collaborated with someone outside your lab and how did it come about? Um, so I, I'm not sure. Uh, about whether it's precisely the first time, but the first time I can remember is uh, my girlfriend uh, uh, was doing applied math and she went to Yale for a month. And then uh, I decided to co come along and I sent an email to the Yale people uh, in PL. Uh, Hi, can you host me for two weeks? Because the, the two other weeks were purple in Rome, so I, I stayed only for two weeks. And so I had an office there and I talked to them. They were working on uh, um, uh, uh, deep tech uh, on Charles' project at the time. And then uh, one of the people in the lab, Jan Hoffman, came to me and said, oh, you're kind of a time system person. And I had this problem that I think there must exist some type system uh, around that, uh, that, that, that solves it. But I, I don't know the relative work well enough. And I thought, oh, I don't know. But indeed, it's kind of simple. And there must exist a type system that solves it. And there were none. So 
we started writing a that system that solved this particular problem. And then I went back to my lab and, and we finished the, the work uh, at a distance. Uh, uh, and we submitted it, it got rejected, and we submitted it again, and it got accepted. Uh, and what I remember from it is uh, that, uh, so it's the perfect kind, kind of uh, random interaction that can happen uh, in, in general. But also that uh, collaborating at a distance across the ocean is way harder than when you can just go to someone's office and write stuff on the board. So, so the, the, the second part uh, was, was noticeably harder than the part that we do where we were together here. Any other questions? I will take your question in just a minute. Uh, one thing you can do when you listen for a talk is train to come up with a question. So it's, it's a skill that can be trained, like any other skills, but it's a mixed blessing because A, you learn how to get questions, you will automatically get at least a question at any talk you listen to, so that's good. If the speaker is asking desperately for questions, you can have at least one. But then you have a question at every talk, and it's hard not to ask it. <laughs> uh, which sometimes has some sense. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering what convinced you to stay in uh, academia and how did you go about like, uh, applying for postdocs? Um, so I think when, when I was a kid I wanted to be a kind of like astronaut and a deep diver and then I decided to be a cook but my parents told me it was too much work. Uh, <laughs> uh, fooding uh, um, critic, but it's hard to do when you haven't been a cook before. And then I decided that I wanted to be a public servant. So uh, researcher kind of fits that. I, I think of researcher as public servant on a kind of international stage. Uh, uh, so that part is easy. The question of how did I go for finding postdocs? So and um, in general, my approach was uh, I will do this thing until. Uh, uh, I don't want to do it anymore, and then I will move to something else. Which, we are very fortunate to be in the field of computer science, where if you decide that you don't like what you are doing anymore, there are many people that are willing to offer you a job. And I think it's very good, and the people that make this decision and get another kind of job, uh, many of them are happy about what happens to them afterward, and I think that's, that's a good decision. But uh, we should also remember that it's a privilege we have uh, compared to some other PhD topics where it can be hard. So uh, how did I go about uh, finding postdocs? Uh, well, uh, I had some ideas of what I would be interested in working on, and I, I, I sent emails to some people, uh, two of which are actually in the room, uh, and, and uh, Amal replied rather quickly, uh, yes, I would be interested, and so uh, mostly that was it. So, <laughs> some, places, some places have a more formal process, they will tell you, uh, yes, yes, we are interested, but you need to send uh, an application to this global thing and so on. Uh, um, uh, and then you have to do that and it's a bit more of a pain because you have to wait, you don't know, and so on. Uh, but you should always, I think, contact the people first. For example, MSR, I, I've never been at MSR, so don't take my word for it, but I have the impression they have a global box where you can send a CV to ask for a, a postdoc or an internship, whatever. But if no one in the house has heard of you before and has told you, oh, yes, 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 apply there, uh, your application will essentially not be continued. So always talk to the people first and learn from them what is the right process. Okay, so the talk is over.